All right, let's start off with one really important idea for scatter plots, okay? The dots don't matter. All right. Sometimes they might. There might be a question where they do. But when they're asking for an equation that models whatever the line is or whatever, the, even if sometimes there's no line, but there are dots, it's your job to draw the line. You're, you're still not worried about the specific dots. So it's not like when we're thinking about plug points into equations here, which we are going to use, we don't really care about where these dots are, right? So like, for example, this dot here is slightly further off the line than this red dot down here, which looks like it's on the line, right? So that doesn't matter. That has no bearing on the question at all, right? Because the whole point of a line of best fit, or in this case, a curve of best fit, is to kind of connect the dots, right? It's doing it in a mathematical way, not in the way you did as a kid in those like coloring books. It's, it's a mathematical way of connecting the dots. And so yes, some of the dots will be further off the line, but that doesn't really matter for us when we're talking about finding the equation of this exponential uh, function, we're not really interested in the dots anymore. It's just not about that. Stick to points that are on the, the curve, not the dots, okay? I know I'm making a big deal about that, but I see this all the time with my students. They get very caught up in the dots. It's not about the dots. So we're still gonna have to think about plug points into equations because we have um, a, an equation right here and we have points. But the points, like I said, are on the curve. So let's start with the most simple point. And this is why if we think about the dots, we're gonna have trouble. If we think about it without the dots, we're gonna focus right here. The dot that's the fake dot, the fake point that's there at the Y intercept, right? We always wanna start with that because that's gonna tell us something because zero has that ability to just wipe out a whole part of the equation. So in this case, let's say this point is something like zero is my X. And I don't know, it looks kinda of like 130. So I go with that. I don't know, maybe if you really want to um, get closer, right? I don't know, maybe 125. So let's do 125. Some people are going to complain if I do 130. So let's do 125 and basically just plug that in the equation, right? So here's our equation. So 125 is the Y. We don't know A, we don't know B, but we know X is zero. And why is that so important? Well, if X is zero, then the B gets wiped out because anything to the zero is one. So really what we're just saying now is, okay, a times one is 125. So we just figured out part of our equation. A is 125. But we don't want A, we want B. So this is why with these questions, we almost always need a second point because now once we've got A, which is a constant, so it's not gonna change, uh, we can now choose another point and we only will have one missing piece and that'll be the B that we want. So let's do that. Um, it really doesn't matter where you go. I tend to find that when we have scatter plots, uh, you, you kind of want to go to opposite sides of the, the graph, um, mostly because if you are estimating, the further apart your points are, the less that your like error in your estimation is going to matter. I don't think it's going to matter here at all. Um, look at these answer choices, right? They're not really close together. So there's no real chance that we're going to have a problem. But, you know, if you want to play it safe, let's go down here, right? So this is the point um, 14. And I don't know, it just looks like 10. So let's just go with that, right? So now 10 is my Y. A, we said is 125, right? We're copying that from here. Uh, we don't know B, but we know our exponent is 10. And as I'm doing this, I realize this is kind of stupid, but it's okay. Uh, we're going to basically at this point, um, guess and check if we're gonna do it this way. So that's okay, we can guess and check, right? So let's, let's do 125 times 0.83 to the 10th, right? Because that's easier to do in my calculator. I'm actually gonna use Desmo so I can show you. Uh, so 125 times 0.83 to the 10th, so to the 10th. And what we're looking for is do we get close to what we wanted, right? So this gives us a value of 20, so I don't know, is that close to 10, right? That's what we said this point was. We said this was uh, 14 comma 10. Am I reading the graph right? Eh, I'm reading it right, but is that close? Well, let's see. Let's do other points and see what happens, right? So if I do 125 times 1.83 to the 10th, what do we get? So let's see if I can get in there. There we go. Well, that changes it quite a bit, right? That's 52,000 something, right? So that's clearly off. And I have a feeling if we do 18... Oh my God, this is gonna be a pain. I don't even know if the calculator's gonna handle it. So if I do 18.36, yeah, 0.36, you can see it's in scientific notation. That's how big this number is. So that's the thing. And we could try 126.35, but you're gonna tell, it's gonna, it's just gonna get bigger and bigger. We're not gonna be able to even have a number that makes any sense on our graph. So A is the answer, uh, basically because 
I did guess and check. And there are ways to solve it algebraically, uh, but I have a feeling most of you are gonna have trouble with that on either a calculator like this or even in Desmos, because when we have to take a random root of something, it gets weird. So if I were to do it, if I were to kind of continue this path here, I would have had to divide by 125, so that's, you know, divide by 125, Maybe this is just a good review of exponent rules and things like that. So uh, 10 divided by 125, I'm just gonna do it in this calculator, is 0 0.08, and that's equal to b to the 10th. So how do you undo a, a, an exponent that, that that's that high, right? So if we undo a square, we have to take a square root. If we undo a cube, we have to use a cube root. So if we undo a 10th, we're gonna have the 10th root, right? So we have to remember where that button is. So the 10th root of both sides is gonna give us what we want. So B is equal to, and I'm gonna do it in Desmos, let's see if I can you know, figure it out. So we want the, uh, see I don't even see the button for it. Yeah, okay, so where's the button? Probably in here somewhere, nope. Is it in functions? Ooh, this is interesting. Okay, so let's see if we can find it. I know what I would do, I would not do it this way, but I'm gonna see if I can find it for you guys. Uh, yep, it's probably, nope, that's calculus. Hyperbola, nope, 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 number theory, here it is, right there. So n square root symbol, that's what we want. Now it's first gonna make me do the 10, okay. And then in here we're gonna put uh, 0.08, which is what we found uh, there. And you can see it's 0 0.7767, you know, etc. So again, it's not really that close to 0.83 and that might worry some people. But the reason is that when you're dealing with these kinds of giant exponents, what actually happens is the more, any even a very slight rounding error or estimation error is gonna exponentially get kind of blown apart and you're gonna be further and further off. But obviously 0.776 is closer to 0.83 than any of these other numbers. So it would have to be A even if you did it this way. What I would actually do, because I know how to do it more easily in this calculator, is remember that taking the 10th root of something is the same as raising it to the 1 10th, right? So what I would have done here is actually do 0 0.08, do my normal kind of uh, exponent button, and then 1 10th, I could put it as a fraction or that's just point 0.1. And notice we get the same answer, right? So knowing how exponents and radicals kind of intertwine is a nice helpful thing. But all of this, just to back up even further and tell you why this was a stupid point to pick in the first place is, yeah, 10 as an exponent is a pain in the neck. What if we had just done the exponent with one, right? So that point here is something like 105. Right, so that point would have been, let's go down here, uh, 1, 105, right? So if I were using my equation, it'd be 105 is equal to, we said A was 125, right? And then B to the first, right? So now my math is so much easier. I don't even have to worry about that exponent. B is just 105 divided by 125, 105 divided by 125, which is the much more satisfying 0.84. So uh, if there's a lesson to be learned from me kind of rambling and getting a little sidetracked here, it's that it's not so important on the SAT that you wait until you have the most efficient plan before starting that plan, right? Because sometimes it won't matter. Sometimes, yeah, you'll maybe take a slightly less efficient route to the answer, but it's not going to add a ton of time. It's not going to add minutes to your process. It might add a few extra seconds, and that's not really a big deal because those same seconds might have been spent wondering what the most efficient thing is and, and you, you're not really taking a shortcut in that case anyway. Um, but I also wanna stress that sometimes when you start going down a less efficient path, you very quickly realize what would have been more efficient and then you can adjust right away, right? So, so many times the problem people have on these hard questions or even something like this, it's not that hard, is they, they can't start the process. They're so worried about doing the right thing that they don't do anything. And that's really, really bad. And that gets back to what we started with in the beginning here, which is plug points into equations, right? This question looks scary. You've got these dots, you've got the curve, you've got a kind of annoying question, right? The numbers and the choices look kind of scary. But if you're just thinking about points and equations, this is really obvious. There's no hesitance. I knew to pick a point off this graph, and put it into that equation. And I also knew to make x zero because that just generally works out, right? And if it didn't work out, then I would have adjusted and tried something different. And so I really wanna stress 
that no matter what the question is, if you're thinking about points and equations, you are probably already ahead of the curve, so to speak, because you are not waiting to decide what to do for every question. You have a plan going in, and it won't work for every question, but for many questions, to have that first step ready to go is going to save you time, is going to make you more efficient in the long run. So really, I cannot, cannot stress this enough, plug points and equations is an efficient strategy for the entire SAT.